Amen. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Let me just greet each and every one of us that has taken the time out to tune in to another evening of Bible study. You know, we pray that the Lord will richly bless your soul, you know, as we take the time out, you know, and just go a little bit in his word. I did ask Bishop Daly for one more week, and I'm going to try and stay true to that. Um, so just bow your heads while I pray, and then we get in the word. Lord, we come to you tonight, and we again give you thanks for your blessings, thanks for your love and your mercies. Thank you for all that you have done for us and for all that you will be doing. We thank you, God, for another evening, God, that we can share in your words. We pray that you will touch every heart, touch every mind, every soul. We ask, God, that you will edify and that, Lord, these words as they go forth, that we will take them and apply them to our lives, that we might be better individuals. We ask, God, that when all is said and done, as we dip into your word tonight, we pray that your will be done and that your perfect will be accomplished as we give you thanks right now for hearing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Again, let me say greetings, greetings to everyone. And you know, our key verse is taken from Ephesians chapter 6, um, from 10 through to 13. And by now, most of us would basically know what that scripture says, right? Amen. So last week we continued, and this week we will continue on the topic identifying and overcoming the wiles of the devil. And it's important in these last and closing days that we recognize this enemy that we are dealing with and that we are able to identify the wiles of the enemy because if we are not aware of the wiles he can use it against you and will get the better of you and the, the aim is not to show anyone that we know the bible or that we can do a research or whatever but the aim is to get folks to make it into heaven the aim is to get folks to make it into heaven so if the word come forth don't think that boy brother Bailey just no but just think of it as the God talking to you and is trying to have you to make the changes necessary in order to be found worthy in his sight so last week we talk about the, uh, the we, we talk about the wiles of the devil some of the wiles of the devil and the apostle did say put on the whole armor of God that he might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And we did say that the Greek word, we're just doing a quick recap. The Greek word um, is methodia, and it denotes craft and deceit or cunning devices. Our English word for wiles, we did say, is used to express deception through trickery and include all the methods that would be part of that. It has to do with cunning skills applied to accomplish the purpose or purposes that are not of any good. We say that the adversary is the master of all these methods and possess the cunningness and the device to trick us. We did say that he caused one third of the host of heaven to fall. And if he was able to do that, how much more you and I, those angels that saw God, they were in the presence of God, and yet the adversary got them to join him. If he was able to do that, how much more you and I that were made a little bit lower than them. So we said that this adversary will always attack. And one of the first things that the adversary will attack is our mind. And we went into it last week, right? The battleground of this temple, this tabernacle, this body, is our mind. The apostle said in Romans 
7.25. It is with the mind that we serve God. We said that there are two reasons why the mind is so critical to, to man's existence. One, it is that it causes man to be aware of his surrounding. So without the mind, you would not be aware of your surrounding, the things that are around you. And secondly, it is how we acquire knowledge and gain understanding of God. You don't get an understanding of God by seeing him because no man had seen God at any time. Nor do you get an understanding of God by touching him. If you touch him, it's in your mind. The songwriter said, I can touch him. He's near within my reach. But that is in our mind. Right? So there is no touching God except it is that you imagine, you think about it in your mind. What I want us to understand then is that it is with the mind that we get the understanding of God. And it is with the mind that we serve God. So for us to conclude that God exists, it has to be within our mind. It's with the mind that we think. It's with the mind that we come up with a concept of God. And it's with the mind that we conclude that God exists. We also mention that it gets more interesting when the word is spoken because when the word is spoken, it gets into the mind. And the Bible says that God has given every man a measure of faith. So if the word then get into the mind and cause faith now to, to, to increase and faith to increase in God, it means then that the mind is extremely important. It's with the mind that we believe God, and it's with the mind that we say, Lord, I give you my heart and I give you my soul. It's with the mind that we pull out all the stops, so to speak, and say, yes, Lord, I am going to follow you. So because the mind is so important, it is the battleground. And that can't be emphasized enough. Your mind is a battleground. Your, there's a battleground of good and evil that takes place in your mind. Day in, day out, there is a battle. And you have got to be conscious of this. Anyone controls the mind, we said, controls the action of the person. Anyone controls the mind, ultimately controls the person's destiny. We look at St. John 8, 40 to 47, and we look at what took place at that time. And Jesus told the folks there that, look here, you are doing the will of your father. You're not hearing me. Because you are doing the will of your father. Neither can you hear me. Because you are doing the will of your father. So anyone controls the mind, you will see the actions play out. Anyone controls the mind, you will see the action play out. So if your mind is controlled by God, then you will do the things that God wants you to do. Your desire will be for the things of God. Your steps will be ordered by his words. You will humble yourself to his will. You know, if, if God is in control of your mind, you will find yourself doing the things that God wants you to do. But if your mind is controlled by the devil, then you will do the things that the devil wants you to do. I asked a question last week. I hope that we spend some time and we look at the question, we self-search, and we answer it carefully. We ask who was in control or who is in control of your mind. And it's important that we look at the question and we answer it. If you find your things over and over repeatedly doing things that is not of God, you know who is in control of your mind. If you find yourself doing the things that God wants you to do, then you know that God is in control of your mind. We said that we should, how should we guard against the attack on the mind from Satan? One of the things that we should do is to recognize that Satan attacks truth and the principles of God. No matter how it sounds, this is what he will always do. He will attack the truth and the principle of God. So it's important that we 
understand the principles of God, we understand the statutes of God, and we make up in our mind that anything that comes against that is not of God, it is of the enemy. And if we remember weeks ago when I suggested for us to draw a line, you know, anything on the other side of that line, you will recognize that that is the enemy. We also said that we should keep on the helmet of salvation. And the helmet of salvation is the assurance of salvation. So it is the assurance that right now you have salvation. It is the assurance that God is faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins. It is the assurance that there is coming a time when God will deliver us completely from this body of death. When you have on that helmet, that assurance in your mind to say, look here, I am a child of God and irrespective of I have an advocate with the Father, my salvation is sealed. If ever time we chip up, all we need to do is to make sure that we repent of our sins, we confess them before the Lord and God is faithful and just to forgive. Satan is an accuser of the brethren. He will accuse you, but he will not acknowledge the fact that you have repented of those sins, but he, he, he will accuse you. So we need to keep on the helmet of salvation. And we quoted the scripture last week, 1 Corinthians 5 verses 19. And also 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 8. The next thing we said that to ward against the attack on the mind is to ask for forgiveness. Jesus said in the Old Testament, if you do the act, you sin. But in this era, if you even think about the thing, if you think about a woman, Jesus said, to commit adultery with her, Jesus said, in your heart you have sinned. So in this dispensation, it's different. So if we sin, even in our mind, we need to ask the Lord for cleansing. 1 John 1 verses 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We also said to ward off the attack on the mind um, that we should not try to resist the adversary on our own strength, but we should use the name of Jesus Christ. How do we resist Satan's attack on the mind? The believer in Christ can silence the mental suggestion from the wicked spirits by telling them to be silent in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a simple matter of using the authority that is in the name of Jesus Christ. Christ. Satan will try to inject things in your mind. The Jesus, while he walked this earth, Peter said to him, be far from the Lord. Jesus had now revealed that he was going to die on the cross. Peter said, I rebuke that thought that is far from thee. And somebody will think that Peter was doing a good thing. But Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that are of God. And it's the same thing with us. When the thought come, we should rebuke those thoughts. And sometimes as people, you know, we rebuke the thought in our mind. Satan can't re read your mind. So if the thought come and you know that it is a thought from the adversary, talk out loud, Satan, I bind you in the name of Jesus. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Thought, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ. You cannot win against this adversary by yourself. You cannot win on your own strength. You must use the power that lies in the name of Jesus Christ. The fifth thing that we said is that we should put things in the mind that nourishes the mind. And we look upon Philippians 4 verses 8. It says, finally my brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. If you want to overcome 
this fiery dart and these thoughts that the adversary wants to inject in your mind. You have to know, feed the mind on things that are good. One of the things that we need to do is to read the scriptures, meditate upon them. Whatever we meditate upon, you will find it just coming out, just like it's a natural part of you. We did say also that if we are willing to live for God, if our mind is made up, even in our subconscious, we will live for God. In our subconscious, we will make the decision to live for God. It's important that we understand that Satan will attack the mind. It's with the mind that we serve God. The battleground for this temple is the mind. And Satan will attack the mind. And if you are not careful, if you are, your mind is not guarded, if you do not have on the helmet of salvation, you will find out that the adversary will get the better of you. But if you really want to serve God, put into the mind the things that are pure, the things that are lovely, the things that are honest, the things that are of good report, the things that give God glory. These are the things that we should put in our mind. Amen, somebody. The next point that I want to make, we started it last week, but we are going to start here this week. The next point that we want to make is that Satan will tempt us. He, one of the scheme that he used against the people of God is to get them to challenge the word of God. And we look at Genesis chapter 3 verses 1. Genesis chapter 3 verses 1 give us a detailed look at this tactic or this strategy or whatever we want to call it, this while of the enemy. It led to the first human sin, and Satan still used it today because it works. Remember, we said that he was there from the beginning. He has been tempting people from the inception until now. He is the master of it. And if he knows that this is one of the wild, this is one of the schemes that will work by getting people to challenge the word of God. It led to the first human sin, and Satan is still using it. The first record of this adversary, him talking through the serpent, is found in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, He shall not eat of every tree of the garden? This, was, this is what he do, you know. Had God said, did God really say, if he can get you as an individual to rethink what you have learned, if he can get you as an individual to rethink the scripture, he would have had some gain, he would have had some traction to say, yes, if I dig a little deeper, if I push a little harder, this person will bite. So the devil invited the woman to reconsider what she understood God to have said. By adding her human interpretation, she convinced herself that this fruit was good for food by suggesting that we should re-examine the clear teachings of God's word. Satan invites us to add our own interpretation and thereby nullify the stead of God. If Satan can get you to just think, rethink, the, 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 the God has given you good teachers in the church. He has given you persons that follow the principle of the word. And if, you, if Satan can have you to question the teachings that you have received, he will have you questioning the word of God. Entire churches, entire denominations are falling prey to the wiles, to this wile of the devil. Did God really say that homosexuality is wrong? He just threw it out. 
and caused church leaders to rethink. And they have accepted, some denominations have accepted homosexuality as a normal part of the church. Did God really say that there are only two genders? Did God really say if a man change his, his organ, so to speak, from, from a male to a female, is he still a male? Hallelujah. And persons have accepted reason it out in their own will, by their own understanding, and accepted things that should not be in the church. Did God really say killing is wrong? If I do it in self-defense, is killing wrong? Once he gets you to put your spin on it, he will cause you to challenge the word of God. If he can get you to challenge the word of God just once, it is a start for him to get you to challenge the word of God on more occasion. I remember back in school when I did philosophy of religion, one of the things they taught us, they said that you guys are a theologian and one of the things that you must ask is that you must always ask why. And then when you get the answer to that, you ask why. And that is what philosophies, philosophers do because they want to get to the end point. But we have got to understand that when you ask why, as a person that is thinking rational, when you ask why, the point that you will end up on is God. Everything leads back to him. But if the adversary can get you to ask why, and he can get you to ask why again, questioning the word of God, challenging the word of God, he will cause you on more than one occasion to question, to challenge the word of God another time. Challenging the word of God is not talking about asking questions because you want to be sure that the understanding that you are getting is aligned to the principles of God. It is about reasoning with your own wisdom to get an understanding that is aligned with your principle and to satisfy your desire and conscience. So when you find persons challenging the word of God, questioning the word of God, it is really that there is some motive behind it because there is something that they want to do or something that they are involved in and they are trying to get the word of God to fit their situation. They are trying to get the word of God to now come in align with their principles with the things that they are doing instead of they trying to align with God. Listen, God will not change his principles, his precepts, his statutes for anyone. We have got to come into alignment with him. I must decrease and Christ must increase. Let us look at Proverbs chapter 21, verses 2. God will not change for anyone. Your principles must be aligned with his principle. The standard is God. The Bible says, every way of a man is right in his own eyes. But the Lord pondereth the hearts. Even when the word of God says it is wrong. Even when we come and we teach that that thing is wrong. When the preacher preach and say that that thing is wrong. If the person's mind is made up. We could preach till thy kingdom come. The person is still going to do what they have made up their mind to do. If the devil can cause you to question, he will persuade you that what you are doing is right. If he can persuade you that what you are doing is right, it doesn't matter how much we preach or how much we teach, you will still go and do what you have made up in your mind to do. 
What has he suggested to you? How is he injecting in your mind, suggesting to you that you question or you challenge the word of God? When the word is preached or when the word is taught and you hear individuals questioning, you know that something is wrong. When the word hits home and is meant to correct and to establish righteousness and you find people questioning the presenter, questioning the knowledge of the presenter, you know that something is wrong. When you find a person questioning the presenter, not recognizing that even if it's a small child, that it is God that is using a vessel, you know that something is wrong. The reason why they are questioning is to satisfy their loss and desire. The reason why they are questioning, questioning is to satisfy their desires. The Bible said in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16, all scriptures is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for reproof. So if the word is preached, and the word is taught and you are being reproved, identify that it is God that is doing a work. It is profitable for correction. Correct me, Lord. So if when the word comes forth and you think that you are bigger than the word of God and don't want any correction, he that is often reproved and continue to stiff his neck shall be suddenly cut off. And that without remedy. And the word is profitable for instruction in righteousness. Some folks will question everything, not realizing that God wants to save their life. Some folks will question the, uh, the person that is presenting, not realizing that God wants to save a soul. His will is that none should perish, but that all should come. To repentance. Everywhere of a man is right in his own eyes. But the Lord ponders the heart. In what way has the adversary been tempting you, been, been, been pushing you to challenge the word of God? Let us find in our Bibles Hebrews 13, verses 17. Do we know? Do we know that when we challenge leadership, we are challenging the word of God? I don't think that based on the behavior of some of the saints, some of persons who should be saints, that they understand that when they question, when they challenge the established leaders, of the church that they are challenging the word of God and the authority of God. You are challenging God's words. You are challenging the word of God when you question, when you challenge the leader because the Bible did say obey them that have the rule over you. You are challenging God's authority. The leader did not put himself there. Promotion come at neither from the east nor from the west, but it comes from God. And I'm sure that, that none of our leaders have money enough to give Bishop and say, Bishop, make me be a leader. I'm sure that Bishop sought the mind of God to select the leaders that surround him. Promotion come at neither from the east nor from the west. But it comes from God. Satan will put it in your mind. Did God say that you must obey the leader? Hebrews 13 verses 17. Obey them that have the rule over you. 
and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. First of all, the word says, obey them that have the, or submit to authority. That word obey there means submit to authority. Them that have the rule over you. Irrespective of your belief. Irrespective of your struggle to comply. The Bible says, it does not change the word of God. The Bible says, obey them that have the rule over you. And submit yourselves. So Bishop might say, I don't want men to wear certain kind of ear style. Or females should not wear a certain type of hats. Just an example. You know that if you do not agree with Bishop, or if you even say that this thing is not scriptural, and you don't agree with Bishop, once it is not contrary to the word of God, if you decide that you will not obey, it is better for you to live under the man's ministry and find someone that teaches and preaches what is in line with your belief. Obey them that have the rule over you. If your bishop tells you that this is the standard that we, we operate in, and, and you can't find it in scripture, you think he put it in there to please himself? He put it there to save the souls that he is overseeing. The Bible says that she must give an account for your soul. But the Bible says that you must make sure that they do it with joy. Because if they don't do it with joy, it is not good for you. Jesus said, you are doing the bidding of your master. And some folks, they will challenge. They will challenge. And it's the same thing that their master did from the very beginning. Because he challenged God. God created him and he challenged God. And it's the same thing that he will have you to do. Challenge the word of God. Challenge the established authority of God. And if you do that, in challenging the leadership and the guidelines that are established by leaders, you are challenging God's word and God's authority. In what way has he suggested that you challenge the word of God? In what way has he suggested that you challenge the word of God? What about tithing? Did God really say that you should pay tithe, tithes even when the, you have the bills to pay? Did God really say that you were to pay tithes when You don't see a command in the New Testament to support it. Let me say this. Bishop Bailey did not say it to me, Brother Bailey. Find some way to put in what you are teaching. Tithes and offering. I am just following as the Holy Ghost impressed 
upon me. I believe that in this area, tied in, God wants to save a soul. The Holy Ghost, I believe, wants to save an individual. Let us turn to Malachi 3, 8 through to 12. It's a very familiar passage of scripture. Every man know it. Most people know it. Will a man rob God? Yet he have robbed me. But he say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offering. Ye are cursed with a curse. For ye have robbed me. Even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. That there may be meat in mine house. And prove me herewith. Say the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. It is God that says, You have robbed me. It is God that gave you the job. It is God that gave you the strength to work and earn. The best thing we can do is to give him the portion that he requires. But deacon, the bills have to pay. But saints, if you don't pay it, you're robbing God. How will a man rob God? If you do something in the Old Testament and it is considered robbing God, if you do it in the New Testament, it's still robbing God. Scripture said that God is immutable. He changes not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if something in the past offended him, in the future, the same thing will offend him. Very important point. Robin here is talking about taking what does not belong to you. Hallelujah. So God is saying 90% is yours. 90% belong to you. But give me what is due unto me. And that is 10%. When you put it in a balance, would you rather to pay the bills and rob God? Or would you rather... To give him that can destroy both body and soul his due. If you are denying God his due, you are a robber. The word of God. And the same is a thief. And thieves cannot enter the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 9-10. So if you fail to give God his due, 
you are a robber. Because you take what does not belong to you and the thief does the same thing. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be ye not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom. If you are not giving God his due, the same is a thief. And the Bible says that thieves cannot inherit the kingdom of God. If you practice to take what belongs to God, you have no lack and part with him. And look here, we can't get into everything as it pertains to tithes. We are just saying that persons have allowed the adversary to have them, to challenge, to question the word of God. Did God really say that you are to pay tithes when you have the bills to pay? Did God really say that you're supposed to pay tithes when there is not a command in the New Testament? I know for a fact that God is a faithful God and would rather to give God what is due unto him for God will not be a debtor to any man. Just for clarity though, your tithes is one tenth of your earnings. So if somebody give you a ten thousand dollars, that is a gift. You can tithe from it if you choose. You can give a free will offering from it if you choose. But when you work, when you go labor, and you get pay, one tenth of that should be given as tithe. And then if you want to do your free will offering, fine. But if you earn, for example, eight thousand per week then your tithes would be 800 per week if that 8000 is taxed then your tithe would still be 800 dollars per week so if you find yourself paying a hundred thousand per month for your tithes. Don't look at the amount that you're paying. For God loves a cheerful giver. The Bible says so. So we're just brushing the outskirt. Tithing can be a study in by itself. We're just trying to save a soul here. We're just trying to, 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 to have somebody because somebody is, is seeking the Holy Ghost and probably you're wondering why you can't get the Holy Ghost. And you're saying, God may do everything. The rich young ruler came to Jesus and Jesus said, one thing no lack is. And that man was a, went away heavy hearted because he was not willing to give away the things that he had because he had great possession. His emphasis was on his wealth. Some of us hold on to the, the, to, to the funds because it looked too much to give to the church. So the devil even have folks saying that I will not give it because I don't see anywhere in the New Testament where there is a command for me to give tithes. I want us to understand that from the Old Testament, there is a principle that is established. And that principle is for us to give one-tenth. Coming in the New Testament, the Lord give us the Holy Spirit. And the things that he desires of us is laid in our spirits, in our hearts, through the Holy Ghost. And 
And this 1 tenth through the TV will be a force. We should the TV have to be telling folks that you need to give 1 tenth. But tithing is refer referenced in the New Testament. St. Matthew 23, verses 23. Jesus talking to the Pharisees. Condemned them for tithing to the penny, but neglecting the more important issues such as justice, mercy, and faith. He then went on to tell them over that tithing is important. And if Jesus recognized the importance of tithing, so should we. He condemned the Pharisees for neglecting the other things. But he commended them and said, yes, you must continue to pay tithe. And if he recognized the importance of tithing, we should also recognize the importance of tithing. 2 Corinthians 9, verses 7. Yes, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Every man according as he had proposed it in his heart. So let him give, not grudgingly, or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. So, what the scripture is saying, you know, and if we follow the principles of God, there is an established amount there to give. So, your purpose in your heart, anything you propose must be more than the one tenth that is established already in the scriptures. So I... Some people are exact with God. But God loves it a cheerful giver. But I also want to ask us a question. Let us turn to Hebrews 7. And we're looking from verse 1 through to verse 8. So the context of the scripture, Minister Martin, it was talking about the priesthood of Melchizedek. And that this was a more or a greater priesthood than the Levitical priesthood. But in talking about the greatness of Melchizedek, the writer to bring out the greatness of Melchizedek talks about tithing. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tent. And I want us to make note of this part here. To whom also Abraham gave a tent, part of all, first being by interpretation, king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor ending of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. No, consider how great this man was, whom even, paid the, even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. Abraham was considered a great man. But this Melchizedek was greater than Abraham, the writer is saying, because Abraham gave him a tenth of his possession, or his spoils. And verily they that are of the sons of Levi who receive the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people 
according to the law that is of the brethren, though they come out of the lines of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promise. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed by the better. And here, men, at, men that die receive tithes. But there he received them whom it is witness that he liveth. Without changing the context of the passage. And here is where God appealed to us in the New Testament. Where he appealed to our consciences. The writer said that Melchizedek was so great. That Abraham who was a great man gave him a tenth of his possession. Who was Melchizedek? Melchizedek was a theophany of God. For those who don't know theophany. He's a way God chose to reveal himself to a certain individual. He take on a form and he revealed himself to the individual a particular way. So in this way, he, re he revealed himself to Abraham as Melchizedek. Mel Abraham knew that there was something about this Melchizedek. He knew that there was something great about this Melchizedek and Abraham gave him tithe. The question that I have to ask us tonight is who told Abraham to give Melchizedek tithe? Abraham recognized greatness. Abraham recognized awesomeness and power. And Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils to this great man. As children of God, if we recognize greatness without anybody saying anything to us, we should know that we should give God his due. Nobody told Abraham to give tithes. Melchizedek did not say, Abraham, you need to give me 10%. Of what you have because I am a great man. Abraham just knew within himself that he should give this amount. So it is with children of God. If we recognize that the God that we serve is great. Nobody has to say to us. Give to this great God. And this is how God loves a cheerful giver. We recognize that he is so great. And we just give out of our hearts. Not compellingly, but we give out of our heart. Because God loves a cheerful giver. I want to encourage us, child of God. Don't let the adversary put it in your mind and get you to challenge the word of God. He will cause you to challenge the word of God to your own detriment. Eve question he just got it in the mind of Eve to question to challenge the word of God and and she put her own spin on it and said look here this thing is good for me to eat it's important that we recognize the wiles of the adversary and he will cause us to question he will cause us to challenge the word of God to our own detriment one of the, next, the other things that he will do, Luke 4, verse 1 to 12. It gives us an insight into how the devil will challenge our identity. So the first thing we said that he will challenge the mind. It's with the mind that we serve God. The next thing we say that he will cause you to challenge or to, or to question the word of God. So that he could, can get you to put your own spin on it. And the third thing we are saying here is that he will challenge your identity. 
Satan came up against Jesus to tempt him in the wilderness. And the Bible says, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Being forty days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdom of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. And he brought him up to Jerusalem and set him on a high pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering and said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. On two different occasions Satan began his temptation with the words, If thou be the Son of God. Satan knew exactly who Jesus was in Mark 1 verses 34 and he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases and cast out many devils and suffered them not to speak because they knew him. So they knew him. But on two occasions, Satan, Satan knew who you are, you know. And that is why we spend the time and we point out the importance of knowing who you are and know your belief and know what you are about. Because one of the wiles of the devil is that he will challenge your identity. Who are you? I am a child of God. And if you stand on that, Satan will still challenge your identity. He knew who Jesus Christ was, but yet still he tried to challenge Jesus' identity. The devil will choose a time when we are physically weak to attack our identity. Jesus was physically weak and hungry. And this was the time that Satan attacked his identity. To make his wild more effective, he will come at you when there is certain struggles. And he will suggest to you, if you were a child of God, anybody ever get that yet? If you are a child of God, this would not have happened to you. If you were actually a Christian, God would have stepped in and delivered you a long time. Look how long you're going through this thing. And you're praying to God. Which God you're praying to? If you were a child of God, challenging your identity, God would have stepped in and he would have delivered you a long time. You are not living upright. If you were living upright, God would have given you that blessing that you have been asking for. Because... He said he will not withhold anything good from them that walk upright. Challenging your identity. 
And it's important that we know who we are, we know what our beliefs are, and we know what we are about. Because the adversary will challenge our identity. He did it with Jesus Christ. And he knew who Jesus was. And he will challenge our identity again we need the helmet of salvation firmly in place to withstand these kinds of attack against our identity and against the character of God but we also need to make sure that we have the sword of the spirit which is the word of God and we must use the sword the sword is the word of God the apostle said, above all, make sure that you have the shield of faith. Make sure that you have the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So you might tell me that, a child of God, you must have the word of God planted in your soul. So when he comes to you and tell you that this that you're going through, you wouldn't be going through it if you were a child of God. You have to know, use the word, and that's what Jesus did. You, who the Lord love, he chastens. So he might tell you that you're not living uprightly. That is why you're going through the mess. And that is why God is withholding the blessing from you. But this light affliction. Talk it man and tell him this light affliction that I am going through is not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall re be revealed in me. You must use the word. Get thee behind me Satan in the name of Jesus Christ. Thou savorest not the things of God. You must realize that this adversary will attack your identity. And if you are not careful, you will fall into depression. Because the adversary will have you believing that you are not the child of God. While everything is, you're trying your very best, your utmost best to live for God. He will tell you that you are not living for God. That is why you're going through what you're going through. But the adversary will try to challenge your identity. Who are you? I am a child of God. And you must have the sword of the spirit. If you are going to overcome the challenge on your identity. He challenged Jesus' identity and Jesus used the word to overcome. Who are you? I am a child of God. Stand on that. But know that when you stand on that, he's going to challenge your identity. But also... Make sure that you have with you the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And next while is that the adversary will use against us. Is to twist the scriptures. Yes, this adversary, like I tell you, that is wise. And this adversary, yes, he will quote scriptures to you. He did it with Jesus. Let's go back to Luke 4 again. And we're looking at 9 to 12 now. And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, 
He shall give his angel charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up. Lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering him said, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. In this passage, Satan quoted Psalms 91, verses 11 and 12, in an effort to persuade Jesus to act in the flesh rather than in the spirit. And it's important that as children of God that we walk in the spirit. The Bible says in Galatians 15, 16, Sorry, in Galatians 5, 16 and Galatians 5, 25. Walk in the spirit that he might not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So Satan quoted a part of the scripture to try to get Jesus to walk in the flesh. To operate in the flesh. But what he did was that he failed to complete the other part of the scripture. The next verse of the scripture says, Thou shalt tread upon the lion, and other, the young lion and the dragon shall thou trample under feet. He did not mention that part. But he said that it is written that he will give his angels charge over thee. In the animal references are are metaphors of a fierce and dangerous enemy. And the devil is this fierce and dangerous enemy. The true meaning of the passage is that God will protect and empower his servants as they overcome the enemy. One of the wiles of the devil is to leave out key parts of scripture in order to twist its meaning to fit his agenda. We've seen this while of the devil in action today. You can go to the sister's house or you can go to the brother's house when they are alone. For greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Oh yes, greater is he that is in me. You go to the individual's house, and then when you reach over there, you realize that greater is in you. But there's a loss and there's a, a pull of the flesh that even when greater is in you, you will heal to the flesh. He will tell you that all things, you ever hear it yet? All things work together for good to them that love the Lord. To them who are called according to his purpose. And he will tell you in your face. Even if you know the will of God. Look here. If you go this way and go against the will of God. God will still cause it to work for your good. I have an individual told me that. You ever wonder yet? Just, you can't just go outside of his will. And even if you go outside of his will, he will cause it to work for your good. Because that's what the Bible says. And the adversary will use this against you. He will twist the scriptures. And in our mind, once the scripture comes in, we are saying, look here, it's the Holy Ghost. Put that scripture in my mind. But the Bible tells us that Satan quoted scripture to Jesus. And Jesus had to rebuke him. 
So it's important then that we know our situation. We know once it's not aligned up, aligned to the will of God, even if it's a scripture that is quote, and it's not aligned up to the will of God, you know that that is a suggestion that is coming from the adversary. He will twist the scripture, he will turn the scripture, he will quote it to you and leave out part of it just to get you to sin, just to fulfill his agenda. And we have got to be careful of this while of the adversary. He wants to fulfill his agenda. He wants to destroy your soul. And he will stop at nothing. And remember I said from last week that by no means can I exhaust the things that he will use against us. What I'm doing is just going through some of the things that are common among us as men. So that we can understand that in all the things that he will try, that God has given us the strength and the ability to overcome what the adversary will throw at us. But he will twist the scriptures. And if we are not careful, understand that it is Satan that is quoting the scripture. He will accept the scripture and we will go and say, Greater is he that is within me than he that is in the world. And then when we think we stand, then we fall. We have got to be as wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Another while of the devil is that he will tempt us. Sometimes he just put the scripture there and turn the scripture. Another time he inject thoughts in our mind just like a, like a, like a, a fishing and he will get us to bite on that, and when he gets us to bite on that, it's over. But what he will do, he will come and he will tempt us. The devil is not coming with anything new. The same thing that he used in the beginning is the same thing that he will use now. One of the things we need to note about temptation James 1, 12 to 15. Is that when it happens. It comes. Because we are drawn away. By our own lust. And entice. Blessed. Is the man that endure temptation. For when he is tried, hallelujah, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord had promised to them that love him. Let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot tempt, God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempt he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when the lust is conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it, is con when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempt he any man. So no man can say that it is God that is tempting him. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. So the adversary will tempt us because he sees something in us. He sees how you are looking at that thing. He hears how you are talking about that thing. And he will tempt you. Because you are drawn away by your own lust and entites. And he will tempt us in one of three ways. The lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes. And the pride of life. Simply stated, these are the three temptations to sin. That 
every human will experience, irrespective of who you are, bishop or a saint that just gets saved. Satan is going to tempt you with the loss of the eyes, the loss of the flesh, and the pride of life. This is another of his wiles. So when he's not injecting things in, in your mind, and he's not trying to get you to challenge the word of God and question the word of God, he's going to challenge your identity. And then if that don't work, he's going to twist the scriptures. And if that don't work, he's going to come and he's going to tempt you in one of three ways. Lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And 1 John 2 verses 16 mentions something about it. For all. Hallelujah. That is in the world. Is the lust of the flesh. And the lust of the eyes. And the pride of life. Is not of the father. But is of the world. Here John gives us. Three temptations. That are of the world. Every adult human in history has been tempted with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It is important for us to be aware of these three areas of temptation that we all will face. For every sin we commit will be preceded. By at least one of these temptations. So every sin that we commit. It will be based on one of these temptations. And most time we are tempted. It is because the adversary. Sees our reaction to certain things. And he sees your reaction. And he will put the thing in front of you. Know that you have a weakness. To take in things that don't belong to you. And he will put that thing in front of you. Know that you have a weakness for, for, for certain things. And he will put that thing before you. And he will tempt you. So the lust of the flesh. And we're just briefly covering. Just briefly covering. The lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh is that temptation to feel physical pleasure from some sinful activity to do something to make the flesh feel satisfied and it can be can be any type of sinful activity that will bring pleasure to the body so any type the loss of the flesh any type of pleasure for the body to feel good, sinful pleasure. For the body to feel good, to satisfy the flesh. So if it's in your thought, just to satisfy your body. And you know the works of the flesh. But he will tempt us because he sees that there is something within us that, that we want to satisfy the flesh. And he will tempt us to have us to satisfy the flesh. The lust of the eyes is that temptation to look upon things that we should not look upon. Are to have things that we should not have. In other words, it is to cast our eyes upon something with the desire or pleasure, even though God has told us not to look upon these things. For example, David on the balcony, and he looked over. First of all, satisfy the lust of the eyes. And then he satisfied the lust of the flesh. And then he satisfied the pride of life because he did not want persons to know that the child was not Uriah's child. 
send Uriah to his death. Uriah to his death. And from you, it's like from you do one, the, the others just follow. The pride of life is that desire for excess greatness or power to be at the helm. To be looked upon as flawless. To be looked upon as great. Pride in and of itself is one of the sins that God hates. It is what caused Lucifer to sin. Some examples are desiring to get credit or glory for things that others did. Desiring for others to worship or to hold us in high esteem. Desiring to feel valued and more important than others around us. Desiring to have positions of power over others in a way that puff us up. Let us go back to the scripture in Luke. And look again at Jesus' temptation. When the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. This was a test, a temptation, and the loss of the flesh because Jesus was hungry. Just came out 40 days and 40 nights, and Jesus was now hungered. And Satan knew it, and he said, Look here. If thou art the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And Jesus resisted the temptation. This was a test. So even Jesus went through it. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up. Lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. This is a temptation of the pride of life. Jesus said unto him, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, he taketh him up into the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. This is the loss of the eyes. Saw all the kingdoms around. And he said unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Jesus said unto him, Get thee behind thee, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt, not, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. And him only shall thou serve. He tried it with Jesus. But Jesus resisted him. And he went away for a season. This is a perfect example for us to know. That Jesus Christ was tempted in all. But was able to resist the devil. And it tells us. That we can do the same. If Jesus Christ went through. We are able to do the same. 
I would like to tell us tonight that if we remain vigilant and faithful to God, that we will be able to overcome anything that the devil throw at us. Irrespective of the wiles, he will throw at us. Irrespective of the fiery darts, he throws at us. If we remain faithful to God and vigilant, we can overcome the adversary. The apostle said, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that he might be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. Having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Let us be truthful. Let us practice truth. Let us remain in truth. Having on the breastplate of righteousness. We did say that the righteousness that God sees is not our righteousness, but it is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But we must have on that righteousness. How do we keep on that righteousness? By remaining in Christ. When you remain in Christ and God looks at you, he will see the righteousness of Christ. And having he said your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Which means that we must be willing, we must know this gospel and be willing to give an answer to every man that asks. So our feet must be shod with the pre preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all he said, take the shield of faith wherewith he shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. Cannot serve God without faith. Without faith it is impossible to please God. So we must at all time have the shield of faith. And it's with the shield of faith that we are going to be able to quench the fiery darts of the devil. And then he said, take on the helmet of salvation, which is the assurance of our hope. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Saints and brethren, I put it to us that it's important for us to identify the wiles of the devil. Not for knowledge. Our head knowledge. But to be able to know what he's going to come with. So that we can plan around it. That we might be able to overcome when he throws things at us. It's important that we remain faithful to God. And it's important that we know who we are and know whose we are. God bless you. We thank you for tuning in. We thank you for listening these past couple of weeks. We pray to God that you, know, you have learned something and that you would have taken the word of God and you would have applied it somewhere in your life. So that you, know, you can be a better individual while serving the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you one more time. May the Lord bless and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. Let us bow our heads. Father, we come to you again and we give you thanks. We want to bless your name for you alone are worthy, Jesus. And we thank you for what was said over these couple of weeks. And we pray, God, that lives would have been impacted we know, God, that your words will not return unto your void. We pray, God, for every child of God right now. God, every child of God under this ministry, that you will cover them, God, that you will touch them, that you will bless them, that your 
anointing will be upon them. We pray, God, that you will give them understanding and wisdom, God, so that they can be vigilant, Lord. Help our faith, lift our faith in you, Lord Jesus. Ah, help us to hold up the shield of faith that we can ward off these fiery darts from the adversary. God, help us to guard our minds. It's with the mind that we serve you. And help us, God, to stand, knowing, great God, that you are the author and finisher of our faith, and that it is you that will present us faultless. We thank you, God, for what you have been doing, and we thank you for what you have accomplished. Let your perfect will be done as we give you thanks right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen.